Well, I am happy to report that my wisdom teeth removal surgery went very, very well, and I recovered very quickly. I was actually a little surprised at um, how not awful the recovery process was. I, I was expecting it to be hell, but actually, uh, once I got past the first day and I was drugged out of my mind, um, it actually wasn't that bad. I was back to eating solid foods within two, three days. So, like, two and a half days, roughly. So, um, yeah, it really wasn't that bad. So, fortunately, I was able to knock out um, the uh, WrestleMania Best to Worst videos, which uh, a good chunk of you probably already saw. If you haven't, go check them out. Uh, the Intercontinental uh, Championship Match video and the Tag Team Championship Match video uh, are both up now. I'm currently working on the Shawn Michaels uh, WrestleMania Best to Worst video and Triple H will be following soon after that. So uh, yeah, a lot to lot to look forward to in, in as far as my videos go. But this video is going to largely be about um, my top ten favorite matches for the month of February 2016. Um, uh, but before I jump into that, I, I do want to do like a quick rundown of some of the stuff that's been going on over the week because uh, you know. Um, uh, I, I've been watching a lot of wrestling shows. Actually, while I was recuperating uh, from my surgery, I uh, I got a chance to catch up on a bunch of things. I got to watch uh, the New Japan New Beginning shows. Um, they were meh. Uh, they were mostly like too many tag matches, which can be a problem, and too many rematches from Wrestle Kingdom. So really, like they kind of failed to leave much of a mark. Uh, the big matches were fine. Um, you had Ishii versus. Uh, um, and granted, this was a Wrestle Kingdom 10 rematch, but Ishii versus uh, Shibata for the uh, for the Never Openweight title, they had another really good match, uh, even though, like I said, it's a rematch. Um, Tanahashi versus Kenny Omega for the vacant Intercontinental title was actually really good, very good, um, and with Omega winning the title, which wasn't a shock at all, uh, given that he's the new top guy in, in the Bullet Club right now. And... Um, uh, Okada versus Goto for the IWGP World Title was was good, uh, pretty solid. Um, so he had some good things on there. Uh, the IWGP Light Heavyweight uh, Title match was good. So handful of good matches. It's just way too many tag matches and way too many rematches for, but especially spread out over two shows. It was just like, eh, it just it failed to leave much of an impression. Um, uh, and actually, funnily enough, the first thing I watched uh, the day of my surgery. Um, and I was laying on the couch. I stayed at my parents' place uh, to recoup, which actually turned out to be a really good idea uh, because um, all the prescriptions that they gave me and, and trying to keep up on that, there's no way on earth I would have been able to do that uh, on the first day. So uh, thank you, Mom and Dad. Um, but, uh, yeah, the first thing I watched that night was TNA Impact, uh, which was uh, Lockdown. Uh, and um, that's just, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because I was drugged out of my fucking mind. Because the first day I was like, I, I was this fucking space cadet. Um, but uh, maybe it's just because I was drugged out of my mind. But it, the show actually wasn't that bad. I'm not going to say it was great. It wasn't stellar. It was just better than what you usually get out of TNA these days. Which... You know, any signs of improvement are good, I guess. And, and to their credit, they're actually doing some things that I kind of like. I, I think Mike Bennett and Maria do legitimately add something to the show. And Maria's, uh, you know, she actually helped make the Lethal Lockdown match, I thought, uh, with her whole, like, betrayal of a... Uh, I mean, it's not really a betrayal. She wasn't really on their side, but she made a point of being a bitch and screwing them over, which was kind of funny. But I, I think they add something to the show. I think the decay... Um, specifically Crazy Steve and Rosemary, who is legitimately scary and <laughs> kind of hard to look at. Um, I, I think she, I, and both her and Steve, Abyss is his same old boring self, but um, I, I think they legitimately add something to the show, and I think there's something to do there. Uh, EC3 turning babyface, um, going to be an adjustment because uh, he's so great as a heel, but overall I think he's working quite well so far. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I could do without Matt Hardy as world champion, but that's the hand that we've been dealt. Uh, the Rockstar Spud turn was okay, except for the fact that he tagged with EC3 the week before, so it's like, 
why would you tag with him one week and then turn on him the next? I guess he wanted to screw him out of the title match just to make it more impactful, but still, it's kind of like... I, mean, I understand why he would screw EC3, given their history together. I just don't know why they would do the tag match first and then, uh, you know, do that whole thing. But, um, but anyway, um, overall, lockdown was actually not that bad. Um... Uh, especially, and maybe that just comes from having really low expectations, but it actually wasn't that bad. And also, the fact that I was drugged out of my mind may have played a factor as well. But um, Actually, the funny thing about last week's shows, uh, Lucha Underground I thought was very good. Uh, TNA, like I said, was better than expected. Raw was um, memorable because of the Shane McMahon thing. And, uh, yeah, I was kind of like, man, is NXT like the weakest show this week? That's crazy. I was like, never thought I'd say that. Because NXT's show last week didn't really do much. This week's show was better with the Neville uh, Sami Zayn main event, which was very good. Um, really enjoyed that. And uh, we've got Joe versus Zayn in two out of three falls for the number one contendership to look forward to next week, which that should be really good as well. Um, I mentioned Lucha Underground. I feel like I should bring them up here again. Uh, the show's been great. I mean, the stuff they do. Uh, the, I mean, some of the stuff they've done has been so great, like the backstory on Dario Cueto and uh, expanding on the mythology of the Aztec... Uh, history tied into uh, the show and the mythology of the show. Uh, all of that's really good. Uh, the Cuerno Phoenix feud uh, just had a capstone. They just had a really good ladder match in the main event of this week's show uh, for the Gift of the Gods Championship. Uh, Mil Muertes is back to full strength after Pentagon broke his arm and all that stuff they did is great. Now we've got um, Muertes versus Pentagon and Prince Puma with Phoenix waiting in the wings because he's the Gift of the Gods champion. And we've got Aztec Warfare to look forward to in three weeks. Actually, the same week as my birthday. So thank you for that little gift uh, there, Lucha Underground. I'm, you, you make me happy. You make me really happy. Um, so yeah, Lucha Underground, it's great, as expected. A famous B and his, his, uh, his Better Call Saul commercials are fucking great um what they're doing with joey ryan is fantastic he's he's an undercover cop playing a wrestler who acts like a porn star i mean that's fucking gold it's just i don't know why it's so great it just fucking is and um yeah it's just I, i'm really liking lucha underground as expected um what else what else uh uh, talk about NXT, talk about Lucha Underground. I would like to talk about SmackDown, but there's almost nothing to really talk about there. I mean, it's it's uh, it's Raw Jr. It's, <laughs> it's basically... But uh, to WWE's credit, I think Roadblock is legitimately interesting. It kind of reminds me of uh, some of the shows they would do. They would do, like, TV specials leading into the pay-per-views, and this is back in my childhood, like... Uh, the SummerSlam Spectaculars and the um, I think Survivor Series did it a couple times and I think uh, they may have used a Saturday Night's Main Event or two to kind of serve as that. It's kind of like a pre-show before the big pay-per-view and Roadblock kind of feels like that where it's like, oh, it's like a somewhat biggest show heading into uh, WrestleMania with Dean Ambrose versus Triple H for the title and uh, we got an NXT Tag Team Championship match, which I'm perfectly fine with. Uh, Enzo and Cass versus... Uh, uh, the revival, uh, Dash and Dawson. Um, that should be that should be good. Uh, I did, the only problem I have with Ambrose and Triple H is that I know Triple H is going to win, so it's kind of like eh, it's kind of a foregone conclusion at this point. Um, I would have Ambrose go over and then just completely do nutty bullshit at WrestleMania, like have like uh, Ambrose versus Lesnar be for the title with Triple H and Reigns facing the winner of that match. So kind of like a mini tournament. And then, like, Reigns wins and then faces a weakened, either a weakened Brock or a weakened Ambrose in the main event and wins and turns heel because, I, I mean, they're so resistant to turning Reigns heel for some reason, even though, like, the fans really don't care all that much about him. Um, I mean, it's not even, like, the Cena, like, Cena sucks, let's go Cena stuff where it's, like, there's at least a little bit of passion behind it. This is just, like... Most of Roman's reactions are either flat-out boos or a spattering of claps with mostly apathy. It's, it's like... I don't know. He's not getting any reactions that you would expect a top star to get. And I'm thinking, look, if you turn him heel, maybe that could eventually transition into them accepting him as a face down the road. It worked for Edge. I, I mean, do, does anybody remember what Edge was like when he was a babyface in, like, oh. Or, 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 I, I want to say 04. Yeah, um, where, 
like the fans didn't really care about him all that much. I, 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 I I'm not gonna say that they flat out booed him or treated him like garbage or anything, but he wasn't like massively over. And then they turned him heel, and then after the long heel run, they accepted him greatly as a babyface. Rock, same thing. They hated him as Rocky Maivia. Uh, turned him heel, made him into the Rock, and then eventually they transitioned him into a role where fans would accept him as a babyface. It just Shawn Michaels worked with him. Savage worked with him. Um, you know, even Hogan to a degree, you could say, because he was managed by Blassie early on in his career and did played mostly heel work, and then he came back as a as a babyface, and they, they seemed to accept it. So it's kind of like. Um, I, I don't know. There's something about starting off as a heel and then transitioning into that babyface role that seems to work. And they don't want to seem to do that with either Cena or Reigns, e- even though it may be beneficial down the road. Who knows? I don't know. I like. I. I just. Uh, I, I feel bad for Roman actually because I feel like um, he's being put into really bad positions a lot of the time. But what can you do? Um, yeah, there's there's nothing really to do, but um, I guess I could transition that and what I thought of Raw this week. Um, Raw's been better the last two weeks. Um, the Undertaker segment was just about as completely pointless as you could possibly be. I mean, I the setup for the match actually makes sense because uh, okay, Vince wants to put his son into like a horrible situation that he can't win. I'm going to put him up against the most unbeatable guy in WrestleMania history in his signature match at WrestleMania. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, Shane's screwed. He's going to die. And it's like, oh, yeah, he really stacked the deck against him about as much as he could. Gave himself an extra main event to promote um, for WrestleMania to make up for all the injuries that have happened. And uh, it's like, okay, so the setup actually makes sense. I just don't think... Um, they didn't really do enough with Undertaker to like, okay, right, what, are, what are his stakes in this? What is he after? What? Well, how does he feel about being used as a pawn in the McMahon family drama again? Um, but they didn't really do anything with Taker. He just kind of came out, said a couple things, and then left. <laughs> he basically said, I'm going to kill that bitch, and then left. And um, it was one of those moments where I was like, all right, so we'll just literally watch Undertaker do anything now, won't we? Hey, are we at that point now? But uh, whatever. Um in any case, uh, a lot of stuff to enjoy as far as wrestling goes, and the road to WrestleMania is going to continue for the next few weeks, so we'll, we'll see how everything shapes up. Um, it looks like we may get AJ and Jericho again at WrestleMania because they're doing the tag title match next week, and I'm thinking, well, Jericho's probably going to turn on AJ, so you might get like a, a final burn-off match at WrestleMania. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, but, uh, again, we'll see how it all plays out. I, I have absolutely no idea what they're going to do with the Wyatts. Uh, they've pretty much left them out on an island but um but in any case like i said we'll uh we'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it and with that let's jump into my top 10 favorite matches for the month of february 2016 as well as the wrestling brand of the month let's just throw on the specs and read what i got here on the screen all right number 10 bailey versus carmella for the nxt women's championship from the uh february 10th episode of nxt uh they built this match up for a few weeks and uh while it's not up to par with like some of the the takeover uh nxt women's title matches and that that very very high standard that was set there um i thought it turned out pretty well i thought both girls worked well with each other they're obviously friends in real life so uh they worked very hard to Uh, put on the best match possible and Carmella is somebody that I've always looked at is like I think there's something to her I think she's got a little bit more than maybe the fans are giving her credit for and this was one of the this this was a a good indicator of uh, what she could be capable of and what she could eventually grow into going forward I thought the match turned out pretty well so and granted she's working with Bailey who's uh, typically very good obviously but um, yeah I felt like Carmella looked pretty good in this match and I thought uh, like I said I thought the match turned out really really well uh, for the most part uh, number nine Kurt Angle versus Drew McIntyre or Drew Galloway I should say uh, from TNA this was from the February 9th episode of Impact uh, this is part of the Kurt Angle farewell tour that they're doing um, they had a match in January that was very good uh, and this match it was a rematch 
and again turned out very very well it's actually interesting that we're seeing drew galloway have matches of this caliber now that he's outside of the wwe it makes you wonder um if his push hadn't been derailed in the wwe what he could have eventually grown into and eventually become because if he's working this hard in tna uh you know it's kind of like damn it's maybe wwe did miss the boat with him you know um in any case, all right, moving right along. Number eight, Samoa Joe versus Sami Zayn for the number one contendership from the uh, February 17th episode of NXT. Um, this match ended in a draw, a double pin, which the double pin has been showing up a lot lately. It happened on Raw, too, in the uh, Bailey, or not Bailey, uh, Sasha Banks, uh, Becky Lynch match. Uh, so, um, Pentagon and Prince Puma almost did it in their first match in Lucha Underground this season, but. Um, yeah, it's just interesting. The double pin's showing up quite a bit. But, uh, you know, it continued the story of determining a number one contender for uh, Finn Balor's championship. We're actually getting a two out of three falls match uh, next week on NXT to determine the true number one contender to kind of settle the controversy. Um, but, uh, you know, the, this match I thought was pretty good. I thought it was an indicator of what Joe and Zayn can do with each other, and hopefully next week with the two out of three falls match, um, they're able to deliver something even be better, and hopefully something with more of a d definitive ending with uh, a number one contender finally being determined. Uh, number seven, I, I referenced this match just a couple minutes ago, uh, from Lucha Underground's uh, February 17th episode, Pentagon Jr. versus Prince Puma. Uh, as far as I know, it's the first match that these two have ever had together. Uh, at least, they may have wrestled each other in season one, but I don't really... No, I don't think they did. I'm pretty sure they didn't, but I could be wrong. Um, so, uh, this match felt like a big deal, and right now, uh, the major feuds in the company all revolve around um, determining who's going to face Mil Muertes, it seems, because you got Mundo and Cage, you've got uh, Phoenix and Cuerno going for the Gift of the Gods championship and getting that using that as an avenue to get a title shot and you got Puma and Pentagon who are arguably the top two guys underneath Mil Moritz who's the champion so um, this match felt like it was big for Lucha Underground it was uh, and it turned out to be a very very good match I thought with uh, Prince Puma getting the the sneaky win kind of, I, I don't want to say sneaky but kind of um, uh, like I said, they had set up like a double pin spot, but Puma was able to roll the shoulder up. And, um, and again, these are two characters that are so uh, so good. Puma's the great hero character, and Pentagon is kind of that kind of a lucha version of uh, I want to say Stone Cold Steve Austin actually, where he's just a, a rule breaker and a, a you know uh, in your face violent badass motherfucker. And um, I, I, it makes for a good character clash there, and I thought the match turned out very well as a result. Number six, a uh, SmackDown match, actually. Uh, from the February 11th episode of SmackDown, AJ Styles versus Chris Jericho in their second match, uh, the one that Jericho won. Um, they had the match at uh, Fastlane, which was kind of the conclusion to the trilogy, although there may be more, as I alluded to earlier. We shall see how everything goes on Raw. Um, and obviously their first match was AJ's Raw debut. Um, and those matches were good. I, I thought they were fine. I think the second one was the best one that they've done. I can't really explain why. Uh, I just thought that this was the one where everything seemed the most crisp and uh, everything seemed to flow the best. And overall, I, of the three matches that they've had so far, this one was the one that I enjoyed the most, personally. And uh, even though Jericho went over. But... Um, uh, again, uh, like I said, you're hardly ever going to get anything bad out of AJ Styles at this point. Jericho might not be what he used to be, but is still good enough to where he can have really good matches. And um, I think he's been a good first opponent for AJ, a uh, good first feud, uh, to eventually springboard him, hopefully springboard AJ into bigger and better things going forward. But, uh, yeah, the second match they had I thought was very good. Um... Number five, from the Ring of Honor 14th anniversary pay-per-view, uh, Jay Lethal uh, defending the Ring of Honor World Championship against Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly. Um, the 14th anniversary pay-per-view was kind of odd to me. It was, it was an okay show. Um, there were a few too many New Japan versus Ring of Honor matches to the point that it felt like that was... The, the show, and maybe they should have called it ROH versus New Japan, but if there's no big angle, there's no real stakes going on, then it just feels like 
it just feels like a random series of matches rather than uh, you know like a, a viable pay per view with stories and payoffs and continuations and all sorts of things like that. Um, it was also really weird that the New Japan guys won almost all the matches, but uh, this was the main event of the show. No New Japan guys were involved, uh, and I thought it was just a pretty solid triple threat. There really isn't a whole lot else to say other than that. Uh, lethal got the win, which was good. He won with a double lethal injection, which was kind of impressive that he could hit that. But, uh, oh well, just a nice three-way match to close out uh, what was probably an, I don't want to say mediocre, but kind of a middle-of-the-road type of show uh, going into it. And at least it closed strong, uh, which was good. Number four, Katsuyori Shibata versus Tomohiro Ishii for the Never Open League Championship from the New Beginning in Osaka uh, from New Japan. Uh, I love their match at Wrestle Kingdom 10. Uh, this match was a nice continuation of that. Uh, again, nothing... Um, not as good as the Wrestle Kingdom 10 match, but still very good, very hard hitting, and uh, Smash Mouth style type of match that's really defined uh, the never open weight championship matches. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And even though it was a rematch from something I saw a month ago, uh, you know, it was just so much fun to watch again that I just really dug it and I really enjoyed it. So, uh, moving right along, number three, uh, the main event to Fastlane, uh, Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar versus Dean Ambrose, uh, for the WrestleMania title shot against Triple H. Um, my only real problem with this match was the ending, because we all knew Roman was going to win, and it was like, yeah, yeah, we, we know. And when he pinned Dean, it was like, yeah, yeah, we know. But um, I thought the match turned out very, very well. Uh, it was actually a really cool match, the way they worked it. Uh, having the story of Dean and Reigns kind of working together to try and eliminate Brock, and Brock, like, steamrolling them at first until Dean had to do things like a low blow and the steel chairs and stuff, which actually, you know... Nice subtle way to kind of set up a no-holds-barred match because they've kind of already established how Dean is going to have is going to be able to match up with Brock because in a straight-up match he would get destroyed, but in a match where the rule book's thrown out the window and he can use low blows and steel chairs, he can match up to Brock, and that's going to be the great equalizer there. So that's uh, I, a subtle way to set the stage for their WrestleMania match. Um, so we'll see how that match turns out. But or I thought this was a really cool, very exciting triple threat match, except for the fact that we knew who was going to win. And when it happened, it was just kind of met with collective groans. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, still a very good match. Number two, Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Kevin Omega, for, or Kenny Omega, I'm sorry. Kenny Omega for the vacant IWGP IC championship uh, from the new beginning in Nishida. Uh, again, Nakamura left, so we're left without an Intercontinental Champion, and uh, this was a good way to resolve that controversy, and I thought Omega and Tanahashi had a very, very good match. Um, and it was nice to see Omega be able to match up to somebody like a Tanahashi, or somebody who's like one of the top guys in New Japan, and he didn't look out of place in there with Tanahashi at all, and looked very good and uh he won the belt obviously which was expected um actually him and the young bucks are now the uh trios never open weight champions uh so he's actually a double champion right now and they're calling themselves the elite of the bullet club which is kind of like it brings back memories of the nwo and the a team and the b team and all that stuff but um, yeah, I thought this match was a very good main event. Uh, it was one of the few, like, fresh matches to come out of the New Beginning shows. And very enjoyable, and I would even say the right guy went over, and uh, we'll see how everything goes, it turns out, going forward. So, uh, good stuff there. My number one favorite match of the month was the last Luchador standing match between Phoenix and King Cuerno from Lucha Underground's uh, February 10th episode. Uh, arguably their strongest match so far, although the latter match they just had tonight uh, is a good run for its money. Um, you know, and it's funny because uh, Lucha Underground, when I think back to season one, one of the only matches, uh, like as far as climactic feud ending matches goes, uh, one of the uh, one of the few that I felt didn't really work was the Drago King Cuerno last Luchador standing match. I thought that match was kind of, eh, just I don't know. That one just didn't really work for me. Uh, so I wasn't sure how this one was going to turn out, and I was blown away by it. I thought it was a very nice, hard hitting, uh, hardcore brawl with a, a big spot to close it out, and Phoenix getting the win to. Uh, 
uh, kind of continue the feud and set him up to get to eventually get another title shot at the Gift of the Gods title. And uh, yeah, I thought it was a hell of a match. It was just a nice hardcore brawl all over the temple and uh, uh, really captured the kind of violent nature of the feud. And actually, all three of their matches, uh, the first match they had on episode one, uh, this match, the last Luchador standing, and the latter match actually made for a nice little TV trilogy there uh, that Lucha Underground was able to give us. So uh, that's my list for the top ten matches. I didn't think any of the matches on this list were necessarily like match of the year contenders or anything like that, but um, there were a lot of like really good matches to choose from. I, I think the list I had was about 15 or 16, and I had to shorten it down from there. So uh, there were there were a handful of really good stuff this month, uh, if not like anything truly, truly amazing. Um, you did get a lot of really good stuff, so uh, that was good to see. Um, brand of the month, I'm going to give it to Lucha Underground. I considered it giving it to them in January based on the strength of just the first episode, but um, now that we're six episodes in and uh, they were able to, go, well, five throughout February, um, and we're able to kind of see the direction of the show and where it's going and what uh, what they've delivered as far as matches and stories and characters go. Um, the show continues to be great. I continue to love it. It's my favorite weekly wrestling show. So, um, yeah, Lucha Underground gets a nod for Best Brand of the Month. So uh, that is all I have for you now. Uh, that's the end of this video. I can put the shades back on, look all cool again and fancy. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's all I have for this particular video. Uh, be on the lookout for more WrestleMania Best to Worst. Uh, the Shawn Michaels video should be up this weekend. I'm getting caught up and re-watching all of Shawn Michaels' WrestleMania matches. I think I've got about three or four to go. Um, and once I've done that, I'll film the video and post it, and we'll be, we'll be set, and it'll be awesome. So, at least I hope so. That, that's really up to you, <laughs> the viewers, whether or not it's awesome. But uh, until then, uh, I'm all done for now, so enjoy the rest of your week, guys.